Hi, this is Mark Silverman. A warm welcome back to those of you who made it, and a friendly word of warning, something you won't find in any guidebook. The next time you check into a deserted hotel on the dark side of Hollywood, make sure you are tuned in to the Disney Parks Podcast with Tony, Sid, and Krista. Views with your favorite voices of Disney and so much more. Thanks for tuning in today. Park Hopper Sid is out today, but she'll be back next week. Um, my name is Krista. I come to, to you from DisneyWays.com, and with me is the ever adorable, huggable, lovable Mr. Tony Castlenova from DisneyByTheNumbers.com. Welcome, Mouseketeers. We are super excited about today's show. Now, you'll most likely recognize our guest today as the voice of the Tower of Terror. In fact, NBC said that he is the only voice artist recognized by the Rod Serling estate. He has also done lots of other voice over work for Disney as well. Mark Silverman, welcome to the show. Well, hello. We are so nice excited to, to have you. Well, well thank you. <laughs> it's, it's very exciting to be on the uh, on this Disney program. Yay. Well, we're going to um, just go ahead and just start the interview here. So how did you prepare for the audition? And can you tell us about that day when you got the job as the voice of Rod Serling on the Tower of Terror ride? Well, yes. There, I, there was a friend of mine called up and asked if I could do a Rod Serling voice because his agent was looking for one for a, a, a Disney World attraction. And that I just found that so weird. I couldn't connect Twilight Zone to Disney World. It just made no sense. This was 20 years ago, you know. So I went down there and read one audition. And then, you know, in this business, it's so competitive and it's so difficult to get work that a lot of the times you'll do the audition and you won't even think about it afterwards. And this is what happened. I, I did it and I felt pretty good about it. But a few weeks passed and I just assumed I didn't get it. And then I got a call back from this one agent, and, she, and I, I even I still have the actual recording, the, the cassette from my phone machine. And she called back and said, you know, Mark, they loved you at Disney. They loved the Rod Serling voice, and they want to see you back for a second audition at Imagineering this <laughs> Wednesday at 3 o'clock. <laughs> Just like that, she said. <laughs> yeah, exactly like that. And I was so excited because, I mean, I haven't even got into this part yet, but I, I was just a, a Disneyland fanatic as a kid. So just to get into Imagineering, it was like uh, Charlie getting into the chocolate factory. It was it was mm-hmm. that much of a big deal for me just to get into Imagineering. I forget auditioning. I was I, I was going to be in there. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So how long have you been in the uh, entertainment industry now, Mark? Well, I've been doing voices for like since the 80s, since like 85 about. I I started, I I realized I had a a knack for sounding like other people. When I was a kid, I would watch television. Right. And I I loved Get Smart. Would you believe I'm Maxwell Small Agent 86 of Control? This was a big thing to me. So I, w- I would love to sound like things, and I would talk into my tape recorder, the wonderful world of Disney. And I would, I would do all these things, and then I realized you could actually get jobs doing that, which was very exciting. So I started getting jobs revoicing celebrities right. in the early 80s. They brought me in once to revoice Al Pacino for a movie. I, I, what I did was his movie was coming onto television, but there's there were you know bad words in the movie, right. so I would say the words like Al, and substitute bad words for family friendly words, <laughs> and they would and they would edit that into his mouth so it sounded like he was talking, you know. I forget so, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Wait, did you see me say that before? <laughs> That's exactly right. That's why if you watch Carlito's Way on TV, and he says forget you through the whole thing. You know? <laughs> but um, I had done that kind of thing, but nothing, nothing was as dramatic and as fun as doing the Tower of Terror voice. Nothing. Right, right, mm-hmm. right. I, I, you know, I have to ask, is it easy to do, you know, a voice, you know, replace somebody's voice on like something like Al Pacino and 
you know, Carlito's way or Scarface. That's got to be a lot of pressure to do something like that. Well, it, it, is, it is a lot of pressure, but... If you get the job and you practiced a lot, you know that you're, they think you're good. Mm-hmm. So you go in there feeling pretty good about it. Yeah. yeah. I actually did one of the most interesting Disney voice jobs I've ever had was for the last movie Walt personally supervised called The Happiest Millionaire. Oh, right. Yeah. It was a Fred McMurray musical. Mm-hmm. John Davidson, Fred McMurray, you know. And somebody in the Disney Restoration Committee found the last two scenes of the movie in 1997 in a vault, but they had no audio track. So they had to get actors to fill in for the roles. One of the, one of the people in the scene was Tommy Steele, an English comedian, mm-hmm. Greer Garson, and Fred McMurray. Right. And I had always watched a lot of My Three Sons as a kid, so they had an audition, and I got that. So the last Two scenes of the movie of, of The Happiest Millionaire, I'm the voice of Fred McMurray. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's, I remember watching My Three Sons as well. And, and you mm-hmm. mentioned uh, Get Smart was another great show that I used to love to watch. I love yeah. all that old 60s TV. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so how did you know you could do Rod Serling? Because... I, my my father's got a good voice, and my grandfather had a good voice, and it kind of ran in the family. Just a lot of a lot of good tone like this, and I never really did a Rod Serling impression. But when I knew the audition was coming, I really got into it, and I always loved Twilight Zone, and I knew I was in the ballpark. I knew I knew how to do it, and I knew that a lot of comedians would overdo it. This is Rod Serling with the Twilight Zone. And I didn't like that. So my Rod Serling was very subtle. You have just entered the Twilight Zone. In just a moment, this elevated door will open to another dimension. And I, I felt extremely natural with it. So I would practice. It was so important to me. I would watch the Twilight Zone on television with a book that had all of the monologues. So I, it was like I was studying with Rod Serling. Every night, everywhere I'd go, I would just do that voice. And when I went in for the second and then the third auditions, I really felt that nobody wanted it like I did. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting the way you, uh, you know, the way you did the Rod Serling. You're calling it subtle because a lot of people, even when they do, you know, other voices like William Shatner, people over exaggerate. You know, the way yeah. William Shatner speaks and. Uh, you know, you just doing that right now, it just gave me chills. I thought... Me too. I thought I was well, watching, thank, well, uh, you know, you. the Twilight Zone. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I, I really take pride in that. There, there's a real trick to doing a, a subtle sound like rather than a big forced overdone impression. Sure. So, so yeah. thank you for understanding that. I do appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, when I was uh, younger, I'm going to probably date myself here, but I remember back in the day, you know, even watching like Hollywood Square and Rich Little, uh, who, you know, used to do a lot of, you know, different voices. He didn't really overdo them. You know, he kind of tried to make it as, you know, as accurate as possible. Yeah. And, uh, in, in his prime, he was great. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, today, another thing, I, I don't really think there's a lot of people that do that. Nah, you don't you don't really see that many. It's kind of a lost art. Yeah. So, and the one of the other problems is, and I know a lot of impressionists really uh, agree with this, is that the new actors today they're not as interesting as the old actor voices. Right. You know that's why you don't really see people doing like Tom Cruise and Kevin Costner, and it's boring. And then, but years ago. Yeah. You know, you had Gregory Peck and Charlton Heston and Humphrey Bogart, and the voices just were so much more interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's one of the problems. Mm-hmm. Well, the yeah. difference is there was acting, and then there's just, you know, jumping off a building, you know, like Tom yeah, Cruise that, does. Yeah, right. We don't want <laughs> I, Well, the other thing is, you know, radio was a big deal in the sure. 40s, so mm-hmm. those actors got older in the 70s. A lot of the one, those great actors... You know, they were doing radio shows. But yeah. now, today, I mean, you couldn't get, you know, the actors today to do radio work. It's just, it's such a different thing. And voices are just so different now. They're not appreciated like they used to be. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're bringing it back, Mark, with the podcast. You're bringing it well, back. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you're right. I went in the other day to Warner Brothers and revoiced 30 lines for Sylvester Stallone. Get out. Really? Wow. But I was always a big Rocky Balboa fan, you know, so <laughs> this was pretty good. I can't see nothing got open my eye. But I, I did. I, I went in there and I did the same kind of a job that I did for Al Pacino, but just this one for Sylvester Stallone. And see, it now was that's pretty a, good. That's another voice that uh, you know you can overdo, and Arnold Schwarzenegger is another voice that gets overdone. Right, you know, gets exa- exaggerated. Yeah, wow. I like to tone, well, tone, tone, it, tone it down a little. <laughs> I like Charlton Heston. Yeah. I've been watching a lot of Charlton Heston films, and yeah. I love, I just loved the powerful way that he spoke. Yeah. Sometimes I'll just go into Target. Yeah. Excuse me, young man, can you tell me where the paper towels are and the apple sauce? I'd like to purchase them. Instead of, you know, I, I really, I don't like it when people will just say, like, Hi, do you guys have applesauce? I, like, I think voices should be interesting. I, I yeah. really do. So I, I, I really care about it. Yeah. So how do you feel that, uh, you know, I asked this of Pat Carroll and uh, Margaret Carey, you know, your voice will probably live on for many, 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 many generations, uh, you know, in in Disney fame, you know, as being, you know, Rod Serling's voice on the Tower of Terror. How do you how do you feel about that? It's 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 very satisfying. I mean, it. There's actually nothing, as far as voiceover work goes, I can't think of anything more satisfying than hearing your voice blast back on a Disney ride. Mm. It, it really, so I do have great pride in it, and it does give me chills at times. And sometimes on a Saturday night, if I see an hour wait for the Tower of Terror, and there's all walks of life in line, and they're all waiting, and they get off the ride, and they're laughing and looking at the picture, it does give me a, a great feeling that in yeah. some way I had something to do with taking people's hmm. minds off their problems and letting them enjoy this terrific Disney attraction. Right. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Can you tell us about that first night, like the launch party? Of when the ride opened, yeah, that that was really something. They it, it was a gigantic party at Disney MGM Studios, with an entire they they had a whole big musical production, and it was all done like the '30s, all catered by the Brown Derby with that wonderful Cobb salad. <laughs> and I'm and I'm just looking at the uh, Tower of Terror looming there in the distance, yeah, silent, you know, and then. All of a sudden, fireworks shot off it, and sparks shot off the Hollywood sign. And the, the announcer said, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror is now officially open. And I, I, it was so exciting and emotional for me. I, I always, whenever I tell that story, I'm amazed I didn't faint that night because there was so much adrenaline, and I was so excited. And then when I first heard my voice coming back in the library, it, it, off the television, it it was so surreal. And then when I got on the ride and heard it on the ride, it, just incredible. I mean, it really was maybe the most exciting night I've ever had. I just could not believe how, how great that whole event was. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's really I, awesome. Yeah, I'm sure it would have taken my breath away if I, you know, was immortalized in a Disney attraction like that. Yeah, and plus I was a Disney fanatic my whole life, so... Yeah. That's I had I that going for me. Yeah, you're a true I, fan. I, yeah. I actually would go into Disneyland with my little tape recorder in the 70s, and I would record all the rides. And I, would, I still <laughs> have boxes of cassettes from Pirates of the Caribbean. Wow. And I would just record the rides and listen to the tapes, and at night I'd play them on my tape player and pretend <laughs> I was on the ride. And it was when it became the point. The, when I actually got the job and I became the voice of a ride, nobody believed it because it was just too perfect. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So if <laughs> if Disney called up and said, "Hey, uh, Mark, you can do any attraction. You know, which one do you want to voice? Uh, what would you say to them?" What you mean, a new attraction? Yeah, a new one, or or even redo an old one. Say, "Hey, we need." Uh, you know, to redo this old attraction, would you would you have a list of favorites that you'd want to be called for? Well, I'd love to narrate the if they brought the people mover back. Oh yeah, yeah. And, that and would we be great. we I, have that. At, we well, we still have ours here in Florida, but I, I oh, yeah. get what you're saying. Yeah, 
what is it called out there? Like the the Wedway people, yeah. what is it? TTA, the Tomorrowland Transit Authority. Oh, that's it's got a bunch of different names. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody calls it the Wedway, but it is something like Tomorrowland, Ter- Tomorrowland right. Transit Authority or something, TTA. I liked, I used to love the the narration on the old submarine. Oh, the 20,000 Leagues? Well, we had one out in Disneyland that wasn't 20,000 Leagues. Okay. But it was a great voice. These crumbling heaps of stone betray the hand of man. It was very <laughs> relaxing like that. <laughs> sea Serpent at 3 o'clock. Should I enter in the lawn, Captain? <laughs> no, they never believe it. I think we've been submerged too long. Take her up. <laughs> and they don't and I, and I also, you. What? You can do all the voices yourself. That's you right. Know. <laughs> I know. I there used to be a line of dialogue in the Pirates of the Caribbean, but it's not in there anymore. Mm. And that bothers me because it, it was such a great line, and it was when you're going through the caves, and it would say, "Perhaps you know too much. You've seen the cursed treasure. You know where it be hidden." Now proceed at your own risk. These be the last friendly words you hear. You may not survive to pass this way again. That was my favorite, because that wow. was so scary. When you're five years old going through that ride and you hear yeah. that, you it, think it you're was never terrifying. You're never going to pass this way again. <laughs> yeah, you, you really think it's, it's real. I mean, that, that ride, to me, is the greatest thing they ever did, though. Mm. Well, yeah. you have in Disneyland the best version of that attraction. Oh God, I, I think so too. Yes, <laughs> actually, um, I I was completely obsessed with that ride since I was fourteen, and and I recently had the amazing honor of going to Atencio's house. Do you know who that is? Sure. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm sitting there in the house of the man who wrote. Yeah. Yo ho, yo ho, a pirate's life for me. I, and I, it was so overwhelming. I thought, how could this be happening? It was just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. That must have been uh, great. Uh, did you have time to sit down and talk with him about his career yes. and stuff? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. And he did some of the voices in the ride as well. Yeah. I think he also did some stuff in the Haunted Mansion as well. Yeah, well, yeah. he wrote uh, Grim, Grim Gritting Grim Ghost, Ghost. One and of my... he's the voice. Of, yeah, he's the voice of the uh, the guy in the coffin. Let me in here. Let me out. Let yeah. me in here. Yeah. <laughs> and, he, and he's the voice of the pirate in the auction scene. Are you selling her by the pound? <laughs> that guy. <laughs> Shift your cargo, dearie. Show him your larboard side. We want the red. Play there, you folksham swab. Oi, the redhead. We want the redhead of us there. I, I know every word of that ride. Believe me, it's it's weird. I know, but I do. We listen to it falling asleep every night as a kid. So right, yeah, it's it's stuck in there. <laughs> yeah. um, well, we had some other questions for you. What's um, what um, what other Disney work have you done? Can you tell us about the other cool stuff? And, and one of my uh, my other favorite Disney job I got was. I got cast as the voice of Friend Owl from Bambi whenever they do Bambi projects. If you get the, the Bambi DVDs and Blu-rays, yeah. Friend Owl narrates the stories and the games and all that sort of thing. So I'm very happy about that because Friend Owl is, <laughs> he sounds like an old man. Bambi, my, my. Why, just the other day, we was wondering whatever became of you, <laughs> Bambi. And he, that was an, actually an actor in the wow. 40s when they made that, named Will Wright. Okay. And he was uh, always a cantankerous guy on I Love Lucy and the Andy Griffith Show. Ooh. And the second you see him, you'd recognize him, yeah. yeah. He played a sheriff that threw Lucy in jail. And so when I when I got that job, I just pretended I was him and went into Disney Studios and uh, did the voice of the owl. <laughs> and that it was really satisfying because it was an actual Disney character. Yeah, wow. I re- well, Bambi. <clears throat> I remember seeing Bambi in the theaters, and uh, I'm trying to think back if I remember that owl voice. Um, well, the owl had that like big. That. He had that big moment in the movie, the Twitter-pated scene, 
where he's explaining to all the forest animals okay. about falling in love. <laughs> and uh, that was his big moment. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> do you have a, uh, like, what are your top five impressions that you like to do, that you enjoy doing? Um, do you have uh, well, any favorites that you like? I guess um, it's probably Rocky Bell Boys. The Rocky Bell Bull is probably uh, one of my favorites. And um, Al Pacino is one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> I, like do, I like doing that. All the time, I love that. And um, Maxwell, Small H and Six of Control. And um, who else? Well, of course, um, Rod Serling. Yeah. I do the old announcer at the Dodger games that only L.A. people will know. Your attention, please. For the Dodgers, running for Jaeger. Number 14, Orlando Alvarez. <laughs> that, when I was a kid, I would hear that. I thought, God, that would be fantastic to get that job. Right. <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah th- those are some of my favorites. Um, the Matterhorn voice, remain seated, please. Permane citizen todos, por favor. <laughs> I, you know, my last trip to uh, Disneyland was the first time I rode the Matterhorn. When I went in uh, 2009, it was shut down for rehab. So, oh, how'd uh, you like it? I love it. I, I think. Did it's you go at night? Track. We didn't. We went in the evening, and it wasn't it, quite it, dark. It's yet. the best at night. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's my that's my favorite of any of the roller coaster Disney roller coaster rides. Yeah. Yeah, and that's way ahead of its time. I mean, that was the first tubular roller coaster in the United States, I think, at the time. Yeah, amazing. And 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 just to be inside a mountain was so amazing on a roller coaster. Right, right. And I tell people, uh, I think, and it's I think it's still there. I, I I'm pretty sure it's still there. There's a uh, basketball or or half a basketball court up there, because California or Anaheim had some kind of city ordinance thing. That something that high had to be a rec center or something. Is that what? Yeah. Wait, wait. That's the story that it's so it's too high. You need to throw a basketball hoop in there. That, I don't. That doesn't sound right. It was I some... think you're getting a couple stories mixed up or something. <laughs> no, there's, right, some, there's something where if it's too high, they need to put a light on top. But I never heard they have to put a basketball court. It was, in. It was some crazy. Uh, Anaheim ordinance. I, I, I'm sure somebody will correct us, uh, or at least correct me. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. This but, is all you, Tony. <laughs> yeah, it's all me. But uh, yeah, maybe I am mixing Disneyland lore. <laughs> it, it might be. Yeah. I, I also loved um, Adventure Through Winter Space. Do you guys have any idea what that was? No, no. Mm-hmm. That that was the molecule ride. Ooh. Where they shrunk you to the size of a snowflake crystal. Okay, we have we had something like that um, here in Florida. Body wars. Body wars, right? Yeah. yeah. But th- this was a slow. It was like a, a, a. It was almost like you were getting on like a, a doom buggy shaped thing. Okay. And you would go through a mighty microscope to the size <laughs> of a snowflake, and you would be shrinking. Yeah. And it was Paul Fries, and now doing the narration, and the the very beginning narration said. For centuries, man had but his own two eyes to explore the wonders of his world. Right. Then he invented the mighty the microscope of mighty eye and explored the vast realm of his own inner space. And you kept shrinking and shrinking. It was very exciting. <laughs> but now Star Tours is there. Um, I'm in Star Tours, too, doing announcements. But there's so many different ways that ride could go. I just I can't hear myself ever. Oh, uh, Really? Yeah, well, there's, what, 35 different options now? Right. Yeah. And I'm also, I just did um, pirate voices for an interactive game at Magic Kingdom. Oh, wow. Treasure of the Seven Seas. Oh, my gosh. I didn't know that was you. Yeah, I'm in there somewhere. (laughs) I also do, um, I do a very classy Spanish pirate. (laughs) (laughs) Foolish pirates. (laughs) I mean, anytime you do a Spanish. Uh, rich Spanish pirate. You basically are doing the Cado Monte Plan. Wow. <laughs> so that's that's where. If you ever walked in Magic Kingdom and you hear the, the classy Spanish pirate, you'll know it's uh, me. <laughs> 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 Fo- it's fantasy land. Pirates. Yeah. <laughs> Piratas. 
Me and Krista were just playing that uh, pirate game in the Magic Kingdom. Actually, yeah, that's the last like, time I was there. Like five whole seconds we played it. <laughs> yeah. <but laughs> oh, man. Well, yeah. now I have to go back and try and find your voice. Yeah. You'll, uh, you'll have to go back, yes. <laughs> I, I want to see Pirates of the Caribbean in, in Paris where it's all backwards. That seems pretty neat. Oh, really? Because it starts off with a jail scene. Really? Yeah, well, it's all different, but I'm... I'm and then at the end, you see the skeletons. Interesting. Wow. I didn't hear that. Wow. Yeah, th- their theory was you see the pirates, and then, then you see what happened to them. They're all skeletons. Whereas in Disneyland, they're skeletons first, and then you <laughs> see them as pirates. You know. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but I, st- I, th- I do think Disneyland's pirates is the greatest attraction ever created. I, I just, I'm nuts about it. I agree. Mm-hmm. Now, I, <clears throat> I know you're a big pirate fan out there. So can you tell me, because I, I was asking people out there, I, the second drop in your attraction actually takes you underneath the railroad berm, and I heard out, like, beyond Disney's property line. and then Right. Back- the, the, the first uh, drop takes you under the tracks. Okay. Yeah, and that's why they even have waterfalls, because right. they've had to get you out of the uh, park somehow. Yeah. And then, but, but when you go on the ride, it seems so perfect that it seems like well, how what they wouldn't have thought of that anyway. You know, it's it's so perfect. I could, they didn't even they, they wanted to just build the giant pirate part, and then they had to get you underneath the track. So they no, actually, what it was they they were going to make a giant walkthrough like a wax museum, right, right. And then they did the uh, the small world attraction of the World's Fair, and right. they said, Walt, we got to do the same kind of thing, but what do we do with this huge area here? And they said, well, why don't we just put caves and skeletons in there, and then we'll make the giant show building the pirate part, you know. But then when you go on the ride, it seems so perfect anyway, and you think, why wouldn't they have thought of that anyway? You know, yeah. it's, it's just brilliant from beginning to end, and I, I just love it every time. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. Now, uh, all right, so let's talk about Tower of Terror just for uh, a couple minutes. So... Your Tower of Terror in California is not the same as the one we have here in Florida. Yours is you kind of get loaded in your elevator and the attraction more or less starts. Uh, here right. in Florida, we you know have like a little pre-show dance that we do uh, before we go up and down. So do you have a favorite Tower no, of we, Terror? No, we, we have the same pre-show in the okay. library. Yeah. And then, and then we have the same disappearing hallway thing. Okay. But the, the, the difference is, is that the, the Tower of Terror in California Adventure does not go forward through the fifth dimension. Oh, all right. Okay. Which is my favorite part of the attraction. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah, it, it doesn't have that. I wish it did, though. But... Um, that part, my favorite in the Florida attraction, the giant eyeballs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's very exciting. I love that. <laughs> well, Mark, I'm trying to picture you, like, growing up through your career, because you didn't just wake up one day and become a, a voiceover actor. There's always the story, you know, oh, I used to work at Dunkin' Donuts or, you know, whatever. Oh, I was an usher at the Chinese Theater. Which was fun. That's pretty wow. glamorous. To, I got to talk to tourists from all over the world. Wow. And then I started, I got a, I, I did impressions of my teachers growing up, and they didn't like that, but it made all the, made all the kids laugh. <laughs> I'm Mr. Branfield. I'm, give me a, do it, uh, the books, please, and a half a sheet of paper for a mini quiz, number to ten. <laughs> I knew how to do all the teachers, and there was, um, there was Mr. Brown, the math teacher. He was a, a very relaxed fellow. He looked like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I liked him, you know. So you do all those things. Then I got a job on the radio, on K-Rock Radio in Los Angeles, doing prank phone calls, and I got to use different voices for that. Right. But um, I, always, I always had a tape recorder with me. just loved to do all those different voices. And you really, you know, you got to be, I, I remember watching Phil Hartman on an interview once. Oh, and yeah. Somebody, somebody asked him, how do you do a great impression? And he put it so perfectly and so simple. He said, well, you have to momentarily be possessed 
And that's really what it is. Right. It's wow. not just doing a voice. You have to actually feel like you're that person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And you really embody that. I heard you got, like, bubblegum cigarettes. Yep. For, for I your did. Part. I walked around with cigarettes, fake cigarettes, as Rod Serling. <laughs> just to sort of get that way that he would just kind of, you know, feel the whole physical thing. <laughs> and a microscopic piece of sand that floats through space is a fragment of a man's life. And uh, oh. that that worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, or or uh, Rocky. Yeah. I never asked Adrian. I never asked you to stop being a woman, you know, so please, I'm asking you, please, don't ever ask me to stop being a man. You really got to feel, you feel like the character in you. Right. It's, it's really mm. weird. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember, like that, huh? I remember seeing uh, Dana Carvey, um, <clears throat> on the, I, I guess it was the Tonight Show, because I think uh, it was past Johnny's time. But uh, I think they he, they were talking about, you know, how does he do some of his impressions. So his Catherine Hepburn, uh, he said, it's, it's like starting a car in the winter. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> that that That's a funny impression. But I don't think he'd be able to fool anybody with that. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, I, then, I I actually fooled Sylvester Stallone's mother on the Larry King show. Wow, they she was on <laughs> as a guest, uh-huh. and I and as a gag, I thought it'd be funny just to call up and say, hey, "Ma, how you doing? You look fantastic." You look what? Good. She goes, she goes. How did you get through? And it says on the screen, Sylvester Stallone on phone. <laughs> So I so I had to do the whole interview for like fifteen minutes and pretend I was him. I didn't want to embarrass her. <laughs> oh, oh my god! god. <laughs> wow, wow, that's incredible. So wow. Somebody must have screened that call. You fooled somebody. They, they, I know that they, they. I fooled the screener. I fooled Larry. It was. Oh my goodness! It was really something. Wow. Everybody's going to YouTube that now. We have to see that. <laughs> but it's it's not on YouTube though. I wish it was. Oh wow! Although I, I had years later, Howard Stern had her on the show, yeah. and they planted me, and I, I fooled her again on the Howard Stern show. Wow! <laughs> so eventually, I'll put that clip on, back. It was on YouTube a while ago. Then I'll put that back. It was it was really funny. Yeah! Wow! <laughs> wow! Yeah. <laughs> do you uh, do you have a favorite uh, Twilight Zone episode? Yeah, I do. I my my favorite is called Stopover in a Quiet Town, where the couple wake up in a in a in an apartment in a house, and they that no one's around, and they go they go downstairs to make breakfast, and they find out like the phone is fake, and the bread is like stage bread. They wow. go outside, and they can't find anybody. All they hear is a kid laughing from somewhere, and they keep wa- walking around, and nobody's in this town. It's scary and creepy and weird, and they find out at the end, after they get on a train to get back to civilization, it just keeps going around in a circle in the same little place, and they find out they're in a dollhouse on another planet with wow. giant people looking at them like they're little ants. It, it's wonderful. It's my favorite. Wow. I you love know, that I, episode. I watched some of The Twilight Zone when I was young, but... I, I think it used to freak me out, and I kind of was like, "What? The, I can't be watching this kind of television." Yeah, well, I'm. I'm glad. Well, everybody watched The Twilight Zone in the '70s because there yeah. were 13 stations, and it was on Channel Five. It's harder for young people to watch it now. Well, that, that's just the way it is now. Yeah. There's a thousand stations and DVDs, and it's not the same. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. But I still, I still love Twilight Zone. I'll watch yeah. it tonight. Yeah. I think uh, I I do remember the I guess the you know the infamous Shatner episode in the plane. It's probably one that I remember as a kid. Actually, that the monologue on that one was the uh, the very first audition at Imagineering. Really? Yep. Wow. Mr. Robert Wilson, thirty-seven, husband, father, and salesman on sick leave. Mr. Wilson has just been discharged from a sanitarium where he spent the last six months recovering from a nervous breakdown, the onset of which took place in an airliner very much like the one in which Mr. Wilson is about to be thrown home. The difference being that on that evening half a year ago, Mr. Wilson's flight was terminated by the onslaught of his mental breakdown. 
Tonight, he is traveling all the way to his appointed destination, which, contrary to Mr. Wilson's plan, happened to be in the darkest corner of the Twilight Zone. I still remember it. Wow, that's amazing. That's you have fantastic. all that in your head? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Hey, I it's funny. I, I still remember it. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about D23, because we get to hear about, you know, from a fan's perspective and all of that. Can you tell us what it was like to be there as a celebrity and all the cool stuff you got to do? Well, I well, I, I got to uh, meet a lot of great people. That was fun. And do the Voices of the Parks panel, mm. which was really great, because I'm such a Disneyland nut that just watching the other voice actors do their parts was amazing. I got to watch an actor named Pete Renaday do the Lincoln voice from wow. when he was Lincoln. And then mm. there was a woman, B.J. Ward, a woman, and she's, she's doing the, uh, the singing rabbit in Splash Mountain that wow. sings to her little babies before you go up the ramp. Mm -hmm. And uh, all that kind of thing was amazing to watch. I mean, I, I love doing that. Yeah. And it was great just to be there and be part of it, and it was very exciting. I loved it. Yeah, <clears throat> you know it's uh, I you know people take I I think the the all the announcements and the the characters in the attractions and the you know a lot of hard work goes into that as much as you know building the attraction. Well, um, of course. Yeah, I mean yeah the the voice of the, on the monorails and the trains and uh, the boats and all of that stuff. Uh, you know I've I've come now as a Disney fan to really pay more attention to that. Um, yeah, you should. We, yeah. yeah. There was a time where Disney voice actors didn't even get credit, uh, like in yeah. the movies. Right. But right. I, I was at a Disney Christmas party, and I ran into Dick Jones, who is, was the voice of Pinocchio. Okay. And wow. it was pretty, pretty unbelievable for me, because I think that's Walt's masterpiece, Pinocchio. Yeah, I love that movie so much, and to meet the man that was the voice of Pinocchio, it, it, I got pretty emotional. Let me tell you. Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah, so I, I think they should they should all get such great credit. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Who, I, I remember there being an official, the official voice of Disneyland. Um, was it something? I want to say something Wagner. Yeah, it was uh, Jack Wagner. Jack Wagner. Well, he's that great voice on the Matterhorn. Remain seated, please. Permane ser sentados, por favor. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the most one of the most imitated voices in all Disney theme parks. Yeah. He was great. He was so good. Disneyland. Yeah, you. As soon as you hear him say Disneyland, it's, you get all warm and happy. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, that that he really was wonderful at doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we have to say goodnight. This has been like crazy. It's been a great ride talking to you about you know, all the great things you've done. Is there anything uh, coming up, Mark, that you want to tell us about? Maybe anything that you can tell us about that you'll be doing in the future that we can you know, pay attention to and, hey, and go, hey, that's Mark. Well, I have a few uh, video games here and there, and that pirate game at Magic Kingdom, and maybe a few things that are top secret. Top <laughs> Disney secrets. <laughs> Everything Disney does is a top secret. <laughs> that's right. Yes, that's right. Till it, till it leaks out on the Internet. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, until they leak it out on the Internet. I know. There's so much information now. Incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a place that people can find you on the internet? Do you have? Uh, you well, know? I'm. If they can look at my demo on YouTube. You just punch in my name and demo. Okay. And you'll you'll hear all my different voices on there. And I'm going to uh, shortly put up some new things, different prank phone calls, and all sorts of little things that I've done. And uh, you know, you just keep looking. Okay. Well, that's it. That sounds great. <laughs> Mark, I have to say thank you, thank you, and thank you for coming on and talking to us about everything that we talked about because it's all great stuff. Hey, you're welcome. It was fun. I love talking about that stuff. All right.